Kia ora, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. This, hopefully, is the last one in lockdown we will ever have to do. Mills Muliaina, Bernadine Oliver Kirby and Sir John Kerwin. Team, this is it. Next week we are back in studio and Mills, I guarantee I think we'll look better next week. Jeff, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it being Samoan in language week. I thought I'd put that out there. I hope I got it right. But uh, great to be back again this week. Looking forward to next week. JK was just about to translate. Yeah, Malo. Malo, Mosi. Hello, Falaba. All our Samoan friends out there. Samoan week. Awesome. Um, what is us? Anyway, Milzy? It's short for also. Right, so, also is brother. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, 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 there. Just, 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 a little bit. It's all awesome, mate. And Toko, and Toko's mate in Tongan, right? In Tongan, mate. Brother in Tonga. Oh, beautiful. Right, Oos. Over to you, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, nothing ever changes, better? though. There's always something to talk about. There's always something to talk about. They've started it off in style. What can you keep us up to date with? What's been going on around the world of rugby? Oh, there is still plenty happening. And look, we've got 18 sleeps until Super Rugby kicks off, Super Rugby Aotearoa. Probably 17 for an excitable tummer like Mills, so let's call it 17 sleeps for him. But it seems like Six Nations and Sansa are finally playing in the sandpit nicely together. They've issued a statement, and this is unprecedented, and hasn't happened before, uh, saying that they were hinting that discussions are underway for them to get a unified global calendar going that will marry harmoniously the Northern and Southern Hemisphere schedules. Uh, even though, they say in a statement, there may be different preferences from the outset, the nations have adopted a mindset that has sought to eliminate self-interest and recognise that the international and club game have shared mutual benefit that, if approached and managed correctly, can enable both to flourish. Preach. <laughs> well, they're saying all the right things, aren't they? But whether they come to some sort of harmony on that global calendar, we wait and watch. Very encouraging, though, that a conversation is being had. Verbal shots have been fired by defeated rugby world chairman wannabe, Augustine Peshot. Now, he claims he was betrayed 11th hour. He was absolutely confident that he had the support of Africa president Khaled Babu, this is the rugby president, and he claims that at the very last minute he switched votes and that wasn't the deal. So he went on Argentine TV very heated, very upset that he felt like there was a betrayal and that they were egged on this, this agreement. Uh, Peshot has said, and I quote, you are going to know why I was betrayed favours are being made on the edge of ethics on our side you will not see any type of negotiation it was done that way and for that reason we lost i would not have done it any other way and you believe him don't you he's a man a very upstanding citizen in the rugby community p shot as we know has since resigned from all his posts at world rugby he was very disappointed, very upset. So he's hinting at maybe shady dealings going on there. Um, some good news on the world front financially. Private equity firm CVC has taken a 28% stake in the Pro 14 Rugby League. And it's believed that this will increase um, its chances of maybe manipulating the global calendar. So that's going to be very, very, very interesting. Uh, what it does now is give the unions that are owned by that a huge financial shot in the arm. And this is exactly what we need, not what was pre-COVID even. Rugby really needed this. And the Pro 14 is owned equally by the Irish, Scottish and Welsh rugby unions. And now Italy becomes a stakeholder as well. So you've got to say those unions are going to be pretty happy with that kind of financial injection. Uh, this was CBC, the same company that tried to uh, take a share of Six Nations. So watch that space. But if you want a little bit of scandal to finish with, Jeff, well, yesterday marked 25 years uh, since the South Africa Rugby World Cup. I know you will remember that so well. It's the one we did not win, 
it was all down to Susie. Well, it might not be down to Susie, but some people think so. One man, and he's shaking his head, Jeff. One man, the, the CEO of South Africa Rugby, Ed Griffiths, he's singing the same tune. Jeff's shaking his head. He says the All Blacks only have themselves to blame. In 25 years, he hasn't changed his tune. He's saying, who eats seafood the week before finals? So maybe dodgy seafood, a bad muscle, maybe a rank oyster or two. Have you had a prawn cocktail lately, Jeff? Oh, you know the rules when you're, up, when you're not next to the ocean, seafood's an out. We never have to worry about that here in New Zealand. And here, I'm calling BS on all of it. Reality was, I was there. He was saying it was Mark Ellis that was throwing up on the sideline. I know from experience that was actually, were- that was actually me. Reality is, I know what happened. Yes, we got beaten on the day. Why in the world would he bother bringing this back up? It was the end of what was a wonderful tournament. Yes, would we have liked to have won? Yes. But reality is what he's saying is not entirely true at all. Actually, none of what he's saying is true. I can give you the full story. The full story has been out there. I'm not going to revisit it. What I am going to talk about, though, is, JK, you talk about investment into the game. This deal with CVC on a professional level, is this the sort of contract and deal and support New Zealand rugby is dearly in search of? Well, when you think about the money everyone's throwing around and the people... And the tournaments that they're buying, I mean, New Zealand would have to be attractive from an investment point of view. I think the interesting thing for me is what are they buying? I don't understand what they're buying. I think, you know, the Heineken Cup over there, the Premiership is really strong. But the Pro 14 has always been the the poor sort of cousin, if you like. So it's a really interesting buy. It's a lot of money for what they're getting. It's traditionally been losing money. It's interesting that the Italians have popped on into the, to the mix because they got left out of that. I guess when you think about it, there must be the thought of 55 million or 65 million Italians, you know, the rest of Europe probably switching into the game. So it's an interesting one. Really, really interesting. Well, I think it's a good indication though, Mills, the fact that there are still people over there who believe that rugby in itself is an opportunity for growth. Oh, absolutely. And, and given, I mean, the uncertainty in the, in the times ahead, yeah, you know, to pump that much money into a, a competition... You know, there's obviously, they obviously feel something, they're getting something out of that investment. So you're right, JK, Pro, Pro 14, it has come up a little bit in the South Africans have joined as well. So it'd be interesting to see how that go and how much, I suppose, structure and, and, uh, and, and, and say they actually have in, the, in, in, in that investment. And JK said that, um, you know, All Blacks, gosh, what an attractive proposition. And where do All Blacks come from? You know, grassroots New Zealand. So you'd think we would be an absolute sitter for an investor if, if that kind of money can be commanded in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we've heard Mark Robinson saying everything is on the table now. You know, we're saying is the game for sale? Well, maybe it's time it is for sale and, and we need some big investors to come on down under and push our brand globally too. And that's what you wait till they see the next six weeks, Goldie. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See that, brother. Woo-hoo! Yeah, and that's why I suppose the vision for what's going to happen in the future uh, is critical for New Zealand rugby and Sanzar as well. Who's just joined? <laughs> oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Prime Minister. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, look, I've been working hard. We, we've been trying for a long time to get Sir Bill Beaumont, and we decided, no, nah, let's flag that. Let's go to the, the highest authority <laughs> we can get in the world. <laughs> what a massive disappointment I am. <laughs> no, not at all. This is exactly... I, I, funnily enough, was the only one that knew you were coming on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I hope that you didn't give... I hope you didn't create too much build-up. No, oh, this is outstanding. We've got... The, we, all the look on their faces is just... <laughs> <laughs> we just actually. Like, well, we're going to have to rewrite the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we don't write questions. We were just talking, Jacinda. We we're just talking about when when they called you auntie. Oh yes. And how it got sort of a bit of publicity around the place. But most young island islanders and Maoris, it's a sign of respect. I couldn't believe that they missed that. Oh, I'm I'm always stoked when I get called auntie. Exactly, it's, I thought you would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you that. Should, you should hear the alternatives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great to, to have you on, considering decisions you you made today, which is yes. which is fantastic, um, particularly for sport in, in New Zealand. And and maybe let's 
let's actually go back to yesterday morning because I don't usually watch the breakfast news, but I was watching you live deal with a, a, an earthquake. <laughs> I mean, have you had time to take stock of it and watch it again? We're just having a bit of an earthquake here, Ryan. Quite a, quite a decent shake here. But um, if you see things moving behind me, the beehive moves a little more than most. I mean, <laughs> have you looked back at it and go, I didn't handle that too bad? Uh, yep. No, it's it's just. Oh, I did. I did look at it just because I wanted to see how much, um, whether or not the camera caught actually how much movement there was, uh, because it looks it looks a lot it, it looks a lot calmer and and it looks more still than I can say it actually was when you were in the middle of it. That I can tell you that they were they were shaking up in studio more than you were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was shaking, and uh, the you know this is my. My press secretary is going to hate me saying this, but he scampered. He was gone. <laughs> I just said my professor, he was gone. <laughs> so, yeah. well, well, a big announcement, obviously, uh, yesterday um, in regards to the fact that all of a sudden, community sport, and that's where I want to start this conversation. We had um, Grant Robertson on the show last week, talked about the possibilities. I mean, what does it mean to you, the fact you've managed to open, I suppose, those gatherings, those bubbles up to yeah. a point where kids, friends, families can get together and start enjoying some sport. We keep, we keep talking about that phase when things will feel like they're getting back to normal. And um, for me, you know, a real sign of that sense of normality is people, you know, being able to, to get back to their clubs, to get back to the Saturday mornings of, of taking the kids to sports. And, and so that is such a huge part of who we are, that the return to that is a sign that things are, are coming back. And it's also for me, a big part of it is just being able to gather again together, that sense of community and mental health and wellbeing and physical exercise and activity is such an important part of that. So really, really important. Jacinda, I was always wondering how long, once you opened up the fishing, how long was it before hubby was out the door and <laughs> fishing? And was it yeah. like minutes, He's hours? Gone. Ah. Apparently, so <laughs> he has he is gone currently. Oh, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's yeah, nice. not awkward for us. <laughs> so no, it, you know the he's you know he's he's great. He knows the reason why we we've had to do what we've had to do, and so many New Zealanders have been really understanding, even though it's put so many limitations on their on their normal activities. And so I've been hugely grateful for, you know, the team just understanding and being on board with what we've needed to do. And hopefully they're seeing the payoff for that now. I, um, another question, I know that you've been, um, you know, I've, I have family in Italy, so you're yes. a superhero over there. It's been amazing what you've done for the country, but how do you chill? How do you get away from it? I mean, you're on the news every day. It's, it's, it's a tough gig. Yeah, I wish that I, I, you know, I wish I could just rattle off the things that I, that I do. I'm not very good at that, um, that, you know, just taking that, that breather and that time out. So for me, it's, you know, I'm a bit of an active relaxer, which I think I, I pick up from you as well, John. So for me, it's things that I can do with Neve, taking her out for a walk, doing some cooking, you know, just taking a break from work, but doing something active. I'm not particularly uh, uh, active in the sense of requiring any coordination. Um, I'm very open to that. <laughs> um, as much as I, I love team sports, never been personally very good at it myself. How, how, how satisfying, though, for you? I mean, you would have been inundated on lots of things opening up, Prime Minister. But I, I was late on here because I had to drop my son off to soccer practice, the yeah. first soccer practice ever. And he couldn't wait to get out of the door, even done his yeah. homework and things like that. But oh, wow. you get a real sense... Like when you, when you drive in there, they're abiding by the rules, make sure you drop yep. off the air and you're not allowed yep. out until then. And I was thinking, man, the world's changed. But how satisfying is that for you that just, I know it's a small little part, but it's made a massive difference to, to people's well, well-being and, and, and happiness yep. opening up those it doors. It has, it has. And, you know, if I, you know, could convey to you, open up really and give you an insight into the kinds of conversations we've had, they have been, well, how do we, how do we, how do we get back into the team sport? How do we open up again, um, you know, rugby on a Saturday morning? How do we get netball back down on the courts? And literally, I've been having the conversations with the team saying, well, look, when I played touch or when I played netball, this is the way we might be able to organise ourselves down at the courts so we can get it happening again. We've really tried to be pragmatic. Um, we want to keep people safe. 
but we also just wanted them to be able to connect back um, again with the things that are important to them. So we, you know, I find myself having these really practical conversations around, well, you know, could we, if we have one parent who could play, could we get them back a bit earlier? So just thinking about those kinds of things has been part of our conversation. Prime Minister, what's really exciting is the fact we're getting our sport back, mm. not only for the players, but for the fans. And it's really important yeah. that they're a part of the package as well. Yeah. Now yeah. we know that we have 100 people in a group. How much can we stretch that 100, considering a stadium can fit an awful lot of yeah. pocket 100? How do you yes. envision that working? So actually that's that's area. So we have just for that simplicity and for the fact that we've been talking a lot about how we manage restaurants and bars, you know, it's been that 100. Um, one of the things that we we're still giving ourselves a bit of time to work through is when you've got much larger event spaces, when you've got convention centres and so on, um, can we do a little bit of, a, of thinking about how we then manage in those environments? And so we haven't quite finished our thinking around that, but that is one of the issues I think it's fair to raise. For now, though, I mean, it's obviously not too far now that for us to wait before the fans can see, you know, their favourite teams um, back on back on the field or back on the court. Uh, and just the ability, even if they're watching from home, I think that'll make a really big difference. It's an important move. In some ways, Prime Minister, does this mean those conversations around that trans-Tasman bubble in terms of sport uh, in a month's time will we'll get a clearer picture of maybe what's possible? Yeah, yeah. And look, the whole idea of the trans-Tasman bubble is movement between New Zealand and Australia without quarantining, because... Obviously, if you're spending 14 days in a hotel after every time you travel, it just it just kills um, that exchange, that sports exchange. And so, um, yes, that is part of our thinking that once we get ourselves into a position, and you know, New Zealand's been working on our border to make sure that we're ready, and once Australia is ready, um, we should be good to go because we are in very similar spots, and um, that's a real privilege to be in that position. Prime Minister, been pretty full on, and I know you've got another test match later on in the year with uh, with the election. Do you get a break at any chance pre or you just got to keep on trucking and go all the way through? Pretty much keep on trucking. You know, I'll try and take the odd little, little nothing nothing significant, but the odd little break here and there, just just because, you know, like anything, you've got to keep your, your, clear, uh, your head clear and just be refreshed and ready to keep making big decisions. So I'm always mindful of, of that, um, but nothing... Nothing significant. I won't be leaving the country, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, like, like TV presenters, you never go on holiday. Someone's going to get a job real quick. Just hang in there. That's why I'm on every night, Bernie. That's why I'm on every night. That's why Just I'm starting on... the seat. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 100%. Oh, look, one of the other things I, I sort of wanted to ask you about is that. Everyone's got a super rugby side. Super rugby Aotearoa kicks off in 11 days' time. Born yep. in school. You've you MP up in Mount Albert here in Auckland. I mean, for you. You're oh. just pulling out my split loyalty here. I oh, think you I mean, I, I, this isn't about votes. This is about oh. loyalty. Where oh, no, no, it absolutely is. And on that, cra I've always been clear. I've always been clear. My loyalty has always been with the Chiefs. Oh, I nice. Nice. Yes. <laughs> you live in Mount Albert. Can, can no, I just ask you, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't much. understand the point. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Auckland. Yeah, but I was I was born and raised in Morrinsville, so yeah, it's no, pretty hard to, to really take the Mulu country out of me. I was born with bells in my ears. So, <laughs> and what, what, so where does where does where does hubby fit then? Where does Clark sit? Where's he? Oh well, he. Oh, look, to be honest, I'm not sure I want to put him in an awkward position as well. But he's East Coast. He's an East Coast boy, so. Right. It puts them wherever, actually. Yeah. Okay. Right. Poverty Bay. Close the crayfish. Close the crayfish. We haven't had a parliamentary side for a, for a wee while at the moment. If you were going to go out there and play, who would be the one person in parliament you'd love to smash? <laughs> Don't palm it off. Don't palm <laughs> it off, though. Come on. Just run, Bills. <laughs> I don't see, so our parliamentary side, just on that, have always been relatively um, successful, actually, as a, as a side. I don't know what that says about them. Um, let's just say that I'm not sure uh, it, would be, it would be great for Parliament if I was an opposing team with the Speaker. Trevor Mallard's pretty... <laughs> uh, <laughs> it attracted a lot of attention. Yeah, a, a lot of jest here. But what, what has been, for you, the most difficult part of, of this, this last 10 weeks um, yeah. given the responsibility you and your government have had? 
Um, just that constant recognition of the sacrifices for people, whether it's a wedding or whether it's the loss of a loved one and not being able to get together. People have made huge sacrifices, but they've done it for their team. And those letters from people saying, I understand why we're doing this and I'm doing it for my neighbor and I'm doing it for you know, my classmate. And that's just made me realize just again, if we needed a reminder, what an amazing country this is. And on you know, well, for me, just to finish, just, just my last, like I've got friends all around the world and I think these are exceptional times and mm. you know, I've been talking about exceptional leadership and you've absolutely nailed it. So just from, from my household, thank you. I think exceptional you. leadership and exceptional times. So, and that's nice sometimes when you sit back by yourself because it's important mm -hmm. when you're in such a big role, sometimes it's lonely, but there's a lot of uh, respect and, and stuff around the world and in New Zealand. So very cool. Thank you. Sure to John. Thanks very much. I'll take a moment sometime in my, in my office here at Premier House, sitting at Muldoon's desk. Oh, um, nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of antiques here. <laughs> but um, for now, we're, we're, all, we're all just getting on with it. But one day there'll be time to reflect. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we got all your faces so good. Yeah. She's beamed in for the right meeting. I was trying uh, to get him going, am I supposed to be on this? Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. I'm glad I put on a shirt for that one, team. Hey? Hey? Start smarting up for the Prime Minister. Come on now. I mean, how great to get an update. We've had it from Grant Robinson and then um, the top of the tree, as high as we could possibly go. And the fact that our Prime Minister is well and truly aware of the impact of all of a sudden a community game getting kicked off again. Yeah, I, I was a bit worried about that Chiefs call, though. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go, mate. Let it go. <laughs> oh, look, it makes me fear, fear, very happy that, that sport is coming back. And you could see that the Prime Minister, um, she's within confines, isn't she, of what she can do. And we're all trying to work together to push this out as quickly as we can. We've done the right thing. We've gone through the right channels and it's happening now. And you could even see almost relief from her as well that traction is starting. We're getting, we're going to get that momentum and it's going to come along quickly if we all keep doing the right thing. No, it's really amazing. Great. Sorry, Jeff. The amazing thing for me is that every time we've spoken about something sort of coming to its end from a country's patience point of view, she's been on it. And that is great leadership. Like we're all talking about oh, we need to get the kids back out playing and then this week, right, it's time to go. So uh, she has got a real ear for the nation and, and uh, leads exceptionally well. Like when you, when you think about how she is making headlines around the world, you know, that's unbelievable. She is leading other great leaders on how she's been acting. So we can all be pretty proud, you know, regardless of, regardless of your political um, bias, she's just been an amazing leader. Yeah, to totally agree in terms of that, JK. You're absolutely right, and, and it is, Bernie. What you what you've said. I mean, you know, it's been a a transition, a progression. You know, and on people's faces, I said I dropped my son off to soccer, and you can just see how happy everyone one is, how happy the parents are to get them going back into sport, run some energy out of them. So it's fantastic to see. And one, how good is that to come out and say she wanted to smash Trevor Mallard? Oh yes. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just hoping that your kids, someone else is teaching them how to kick mills. That's all I can. That's <laughs> all I'm concerned about right now. It's a round ball. It's a round ball, mate. It's a round ball. It's fine. Yes, we are just 11 days out from the start of Super Rugby Aotearoa. Once again, we've talked inside camps. Last week, it was the Crusaders. We talked inside the Blues with Patrick Tuipolotu. Let's go down to Wellington, the Hurricanes, fullback, outside back, part-time first five. Jordy Barrett joins us. On the breakdown, and Jordy, um, a week in camp now, the Hurricanes. How, how's everyone come together? Yeah, it's been exciting. Um, yeah, good evening as well, guys. Um, it's nice to talk to you. Um, I guess uh, the boys um, missed each other um, by the looks of everyone, and um, it's been a really good week. Um, just come back into training again this week. So, um, yeah, there's a good buzz in the group, and uh, everyone's excited, and we're just, I guess, grateful to be in a position where we can get back and train and um, yeah, compete again. 
So, Geordie, what's going on with the lid, mate? Ten weeks without the barber? Haven't you got it? Well, isn't one of the boys, one of the, like, is Artie severe, the barber, or what's going on? Don't trust him? Um, I've actually dished out three or four haircuts um, since Level 2 started, but um, haven't had the nerve to give give myself a crack. So, um, I'm, I'm on the waiting list at the Kilburnie Barber. So, um, yeah, maybe next week. Everyone has a, a player in their team. When they get an opportunity, they come back from a break. They come in hot. Was there anyone that came back into, you know, last week? Maybe just that little bit more hype than everybody else. Um, there's plenty of them. Uh, yeah, Liam Mitchell and um, Riccatelli are running around, sliding everywhere, and uh, a bit too excited. So, but it is good to see it put a smile on everyone's faces. And um, yeah, there's a genuine excitement in the group. Yeah, they talk a lot about, um, you know, the players needing the four weeks to get back into contact, Geordie. What, is, what does that mean? Because Goldie and I, we didn't like any sort of contact, any sort of tackling, not even rucks, actually. But what does that mean for an outside back, someone like you? What does going back to contact, you know, on a daily basis at training mean for you? Yeah, I guess the trainers just want us to progress and start off by hitting um, tackle pads and, even within our gym sessions, um, uh, we'll do a set on the bench press and go over and work with Corey Jane and tackle each other onto some gym mats and just slowly build up, um, get the neck and the head and shoulders going again because um, luckily we didn't come back and go, um, yeah, full noise because it does take, well, it certainly does take me a few days to get over those bumps. But um, this week we started to progress a little bit more, um, tackling body on body and just, um, injury prevention basically the form you showed early mate i was i was thinking about you um you know you've had a great rise to the all back ranks you're now an established super rugby player but now is your challenge to show some form and really nail one of those spots in the all black and get your get your name there first rather than being someone that might you know i mean you you do an amazing job covering lots of positions and if so what are you sort of targeting moving forward in that black jersey yeah, that's right. Um, I think for me, it's bigger picture. Um, I look at my game and I always think I'm taking a lot of learnings uh, each and every time I play. So um, it's all about, um, I guess, I'm always going to be learning, but trying to use experiences in the past to make me a better footy player and play in those different positions. And I guess grow my game just to um, be a leader within our Hurricanes group and um, try to drive us around the park and have a lot more influence on our um, results. I know that's been locked down. It's been hard on the on the on the golfers in our rugby fraternity. But why are why are all people who like kicking goals like golf? What's what's going on with that? And how is your form? Um, generally speaking, I think goal kickers and tens of uh, very competitive people and golf's one of those games where you catch the bug and you feel like you're going to get better all the time so you can't eventually get away from it um, and I guess a lot of things in golf relate to goal kicking um, just the mental side of it and um, golf brings you back down to the earth pretty quickly um, so look I've, well, I enjoy my golf spent a lot of time um, yeah, practicing inside over lockdown so it's been good to get out Who's got the bragging rights and the canes? Yeah, I was about to, well, so more importantly, who's got bragging rights with your brother at the moment? Mm. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's, you know, uh, and he does, to be fair, he plays a lot. He, pl he does play a lot, but you're out there as well. Who's got bragging rights there? And let's be honest, the first time, it's not that far away that he's playing for the Blues up against the Hurricanes. Is it, is it, are you as motivated in the golf as you are as this first game of rugby against him? Sure. I'm not sure uh, which one I'm looking forward to more, actually. Uh, with the golf, generally speaking, I'll flip a coin uh, with the same handicap and whatnot. But, um, yeah, when I looked at the calendar or our draw and saw we had the Blues up there first game, um, I guess I couldn't have set the scene any better. Oh, understated, JK. Understated. Oh, like <laughs> there's oh, a, there's, he's, he's, he's nodding away. Oh, we, we absolutely love it. Look, uh, look, we appreciate you coming on the show. We know you've got to prepare well. It's not going to be easy when you're first out there, but uh, your form to start off the season was sublime. We're looking forward to seeing it once again in a Hurricanes jersey. Thanks for joining us on the breakdown tonight, mate. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys.
Don't forget, on Thursday night, Sky Sport presents The Pod. This week, it's two Hawks Bay boys. Ian Smith, he interviews Israel Dagg. Wasn't the smartest thing I've ever made in, in that uh, quarterfinal. Me and my, my mate Corey going out to town and and uh, being idiots. Um, worst thing about that, Smithy, was that uh, that was Millsy's last game for the All Blacks and hundredth test. And for me and and Corey to go out there and take the limelight away from him, a special human doing special things in, in a special jersey. That's the one thing that really affects me is, is knowing that I took his line my way by me being selfish and going out and doing it and uh, you know just thinking about myself and going and get on the piss and letting the team down you know like quarter final in the world cup but the team doesn't need that external pressure knowing that two idiots went out and did that and if it wasn't a, for a world cup we are gone smithy wanted us gone wayne smith was like get rid of them I'm sick of it I'm done Well, with Super Rugby just around the corner, we are 11 days away. We talk about players, we've talked to coaches, but we don't want to forget about the man in the middle, the referee. He's got an important role. We know that, and we've gone to the top of the tree here in New Zealand. Ben O'Keefe, he joins us. And Ben, I suppose this will be the longest time you've had on the sidelines watching the game. Are you a bit nervous about getting back out there in a couple of weeks? Oh, hey, God, like, I'm, I'm so excited. I can't wait to get back in the middle. Um, but you're right, it's been the longest that I've been been home for because normally, you know, Super, super Rugby and, and Rugby goes from February to November. Um, we're packing our bags for the weekend for a game, either heading off in New Zealand somewhere or heading off overseas. So I've been stuck at home for two months. Um, yeah, I'm ready to get back on the road for sure. If you were referee God, what would be one of the things that you would change right now moving forward? Jeez, straight into it, aren't we? Um, I think um, you're right. Like, this has been a great opportunity for not just rugby, but everything outside of rugby. Everyone's been able to sit back and actually look at um, you know, how we do things and how we can make them better. Um, so for me, for example, like I think I think the game, especially down here in um, Super Rugby, is really, really good. Like We have a, a great style of rugby and a great brand of rugby that we're involved in. Um, so for me, I don't want to tweak too much. I probably just want to um, reinforce what we're doing and um, just get really accurate with that and just work more with the players and the coaches so that we can actually, you know, put a really good uh, brand of rugby out there for, for people to watch. And I think, um, you know, around the corner coming up, we're going we're gonna to have the opportunity, opportunity to do that. So um, that's why I'm excited just to get back out there because it's going to be some um, awesome games coming up. What are the focus areas that everyone has agreed on is going to be important for these contests? Yeah, so God, we were lucky. Uh, we had a uh, meeting with the coaches um, a few weeks ago and, you know, we were able to collaborate with them um, and basically provide, you know, they, they told us what they want. Um, they want to be able to play a good brand of rugby, fast pace, you know, lots of entertaining tries, um, get the ball wide. And uh, we thought, you know, as referees, we can provide that. Um, so uh, really a lot of it's actually just about reinforcing, you know, what we're doing now. So making sure that we get quick ball, making sure we get good contests. So, we, you know, we do see the legal turnover at the, at the tackle. And I think, um, you know, by, by, by getting on the same track, us referees in New Zealand, because we're all going to be in one, one small group, uh, we're going to be able to be pretty consistent week by week. And I think when you get consistency with the rules, um, you know, you'll get consistency with um, how the players trust us. And if they trust us, then they can, they can just let loose. Ben, are we allowed to tweak with any of the rules? Are we allowed to play with them just because it's our competition and we can do what the English do and don't give a shit about anyone else and just go for it? Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it'll it'll be interesting. You're right. It is. Um, you know, it's going to be a pretty exciting ten weeks where um, we can sort of you know create a style of rugby that you know the rest of the world's going to be watching. So, um, you know, I think there's going to be a few few little tweaks, maybe some innovations in there. Um, but as everything's developed so quickly, um, I'm not I'm not sure what they are yet, but um. No doubt we'll, uh, we'll get the rundown pretty quickly because we're going to have to get out there. Um, I mean, we're hearing get it possibilities around the likes of changing around the red card rules, whether or not there's a possibility of golden point. Are these things that have been put on the table? And are you optimistic those are things which are going to add to the spectacle? Yeah, look, I think um, uh, whenever there's an opportunity, uh, like, well, we haven't really had an opportunity like this where we can actually tweak some things and you know create a style of rugby that we've uh, probably wanted for the last few years. So... Um, there has been a lot of stuff being put on the table. And I think um, even those examples you said there, um, from a refereeing point of view, uh, would really you know, help us and help the game. Um, so, yeah, if we find out that it happens, then I reckon it's going to be, going to be really, really good. 
I was with a very old Frenchman one night smoking cigars and drinking cognac. And uh, his name was... You've been doing that for six months. You've like eight weeks of doing that. Come on. <laughs> exactly. His name was Albert Ferrer. And he said, there is, John, he said, there is nothing wrong with our law. It's just that people are continuing to break it. So that sort of gets me to the offside law. I mean, if everyone stuck to the, to the letter of the law, we would have that distance. But what is happening around that? I know there's been a lot of talk about the ARs. We get frustrated in the commentary box because if we keep the distance, we can attack. I mean, have you spoken about how you're going to work as a team and what the players have to contribute to, you know, stick within the law? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, as players and coaches, they're always trying to get an edge on the opposition. And I don't think we need to criticise a, a team for wanting to do that. You know, they want to win a game of rugby. So I actually admire, you know, the um, you know the guys that are trying to creep. And, you know, if we don't, if we miss them, then, hey, they're not offside. You know, they get away with it. But um, the, the great thing about this season is that um, what, what the competition has allowed us to do is, is because we, we can't have any travel. So um, the referees from South Africa, Australia, so the Yako Pipers, the Angus Gardeners, um, you know, they can't come and fly in and, and help us out with these games. But it's allowed us to really get the five professional referees in New Zealand um, to get on board together and work as a team Saturday and Sunday uh, every week to um, be consistent and work together. So one big focus for us is um, is that space. And I think, uh, you know, often we've probably left, left that up to the referee over the last few years to sort of manage. And then sometimes the ARs have come in to help us out and sometimes they haven't. Um, but I think the commentators will probably get pretty annoyed uh, for the next 10 weeks because they're going to hear a lot of us um, referees and ARs talking to, to each other in the background so that, you know, we're all in, all in sync throughout the whole game. So I think um, kick chase, um, offsides at the ruck, um, you know, there's going, to be, there's going to be quite a few pairs of eyes on that now. So we should be able to open up the space um, for the attacking team. You know, when you went north for the first time, what was the biggest difference from you hopping on a plane Reffing Southern Hemisphere and then getting off a plane in Northern Hemisphere. What after the game? What did you sit down and say to yourself? Wow, what was the biggest difference? Well, for me, it was it was pretty much why well, I, I came to the fact that I was probably just going to spend the rest of my life in winters now, sort of going north in January and then then June down here as well. But um, the biggest thing for me, because my first experience up north was a Six Nations game. Now, I, I grew up watching the All Blacks in Australia, all those all the Southern Hemisphere games. I you know, loved it, but didn't really appreciate it, probably what Six Nations was. So I went up there and I ran touch for um, uh, Wales vs Island at the Aviva. And the, the, the Saturday morning was packed. The, the Saturday day at Aviva Stadium, there's more Welsh supporters there than Irish. And, I, you know, that sense of sort of occasion and, you know, the, tra the tradition with the aftermatch afterwards, you know, I really sat down and I really appreciated what, um, you know, global rugby was. Um, so for me, that was the big difference. And in terms of the style of game, it definitely was, um, you know, the subtleties there. You, you refereed a lot more line out to mall. Um, there was a lot more scrum collapses or, you know, potentially um, teams scrumming for penalties. So it brought you into that as a referee a bit more. Um, but they're all, they're all good challenges so that, um, you know, you sort, of, you sort of get challenged in different ways when you go up north and you get challenged in different ways, especially when maybe the northern hemisphere referees come down, come down south as well. Well, we're going into the community season now. The fact that the announcement has been made by the government, the fact that all of a sudden clubs can start uh, training again, but... Understanding is though across the country there's a shortage of referees. I mean, what what would your message to be as our one of our leading professionals? If they, what sort of encouragement could you give to people who can't maybe play or are parents? Maybe the things they would focus on if, if they decided to pick up a whistle. Look, I mean, it's always it's always part of um, being part of rugby is you know such a special thing. Whether you, you know you were a player or um, you're a coach, um, but as a referee, you know the experiences that I've been able to do. Um, around the world with my games that even just in super rugby but you know some of the best games I've been involved in um, are, are the community of the club games I've, I've been able to do and I've just moved up to um, Horofino Kapiti um, so just north of Wellington so you know a smaller region and you know I was really disappointed when um, obviously everything went down I thought I'd be able to get a few club games in this year um, so I'm still I'm still gunning for that I'd, I'd love to be able to get some club games um, because you know you go down you go to a club match there's probably only a few hundred people there and you go to the aftermatch and, you know, everyone's family's there and you, know, you can see what it means to them. For me, that reminds me, you know, of why I'm involved in rugby. And I think, um, you know, potentially, potentially not a lot of people understand that, you know, you can still be involved um, as a referee and you actually get a really, really good um, experience being involved um, on a Saturday. You know, obviously it keeps you fit and we've all been trying to do that over the last few weeks. You know, it's an awesome feeling walking off the field when, you know, you've been part of a game of rugby. So what do you think the perception is out there and how do we 
attract you know how attract some of these young players to get into the game to be referees um you know that's a good question jk like i reckon that the big part of it is just being able to give it a go um i think some people believe that uh, as soon as you finish playing rugby that's when you become a referee but it's not you can actually you know you can dip in and dip out um you know i'd, all enc- I'd always encourage um people to start refereeing you know while they're playing rugby or, or any other sport in fact and it doesn't mean you can't play rugby in the weekend with your mates because you know you're right it is you know you're always encouraged you know stay in the game play for as long as you can with your, with your mates and enjoy it but um you know pick up the whistle on the weekend for and you might only do one or two games one or two games a season um but just you know provides the opportunity later on to be able to get involved um and you do you know you, you can run into some of the some of the sort of negative experiences potentially, um, you know, people on the sideline. Everyone has an opinion. Um, that opinion, you know, goes right from the top all the way down to you know community rugby. But um, you know, you certainly learn a lot about yourself, and you learn a lot about um, how to deal with those situations. Um, but certainly, I think uh, you know the, the positives, you know, outweigh all those other um, other parts of you know becoming a referee. So I will just encourage them, get people to give it a go. If you give it a go, then you can. Um, and if you can see yourself doing it, then you know, good on you. Fantastic. Look, Ben, uh, I know you've been training hard. You're preparing yourself for what's going to be a great 10-week competition. We're looking forward to seeing you back out there. Um, I say, let's, uh, let's get back to work. Let's uh, get into our, uh, into our games and, uh, mate, look forward to seeing you on the sidelines. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Can't wait. Good luck, Ben. Cheers. Stay with us. Up after the break, the one and only Nihi Milnaskada. Welcome back to the breakdown. Well, it's an outside back fest. We've talked to Geordie Barrett. Now we're talking to someone I think has never looked better. Nehemilda Scudder's finally got the right jersey on. It's a Highlanders one. He's <laughs> down. Hey, come on now. Mills, you know, you know, this is his opportunity to play under the roof at Forsyth Bar Stadium. Nehe, great to join us. Uh, first and foremost, what, what inspired you? Let's say inspired you to make the shift down to Dunedin and move to the Highlanders? Um, yeah, hey, Goldie, Millsy. Um, bro, yeah, plenty of reasons, I guess, for, for drawing on inspiration to go down go down south. Um, you know, excited about the playing group that they've got down there. Um, there's always been, for me personally, a bit of a rivalry with, with the Landers crew. Uh, you know, you've got to go back to 2015. That final always sticks out, and there's um, been plenty of conversations happening around that. Uh, since I've been down there over the last week. But, um, you know, I've, yeah, just, I guess, the excitement to, to play with this group. Um, the coaching staff is, is awesome. And, and like you touched on as well, you can't sort of complain weather-wise when you're, when you're playing under a roof every weekend. So, um, yeah, bro, I'm bloody chuffed to, to be in amongst the group and, and be down in Dunedin. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a long time. And I know you, you know, can't imagine you know, how much of the injuries that you've, the toll it's taken on you. But someone that's been really inspirational to you is, is your wife, Hannah. Can you share a little bit uh, about that with us? Oh, yeah, bro, 100%. Um, you know, I've yeah, been lucky to have a massive support system around me. And, um, you know, without a doubt, I've been through some challenging times. And, you know, I think she's definitely been the rock, the person um, you know got me up off the off the bedroom floor and you know i've just been wanting to chuck it in and she's just been there bro pretty much you know 100 percent 24 7 just reminding me um you know why why i love the game why i want to play it and just not to give up um and so yeah bro i'm very blessed and and lucky that she's she's been there beside me it's a, a tough one because she won't be moving down um at first to come down to Dunedin. so you know, it'll be a bit of a shock, I guess, even after COVID, sort of being together for six weeks, 
um, you know, being around each other all the time to, to shifting down south. But um, yeah, no, nah, she's an amazing woman, bro. So yeah, I'm very, very, very lucky. And this is a significant change, though. The plan was to go to France and to move to Toulon. How did that all unfold, the fact that all of a sudden your future ended up becoming back here in New Zealand? Yeah, I guess um, sort of a bit of a comparison going from south of France to uh, south of uh, New Zealand. But, yeah, it was a, it was a tough one. Um, yeah, I think from last year with all the complications I had with, with my shoulder and um, trying to get it right by the time I was supposed to take up my contract, um, yeah, just it wasn't ready in time. So between um, you know, specialists and surgeons here and the medical team over in Toulon, they sort of just yeah, agreed that um, yeah, I wouldn't be ready to take up the contract, which yeah, which was yeah, pretty gutting because you know there was something I um, had my sights set on all the last year, and uh, with my injury, you know there was the plan to work towards that, but. Yeah, I guess um, silver lining in that is, yeah, that it's allowed me to, to be where I am now. And, um, you know, as much as sometimes I do look back to some of the tougher times, you know, it sort of just all makes um, sense and gives me a bit of confidence now that, that I'm here and able to yeah, move forward and push ahead. Is it, is it hard to adjust, um, you know, coming from the, the hurricanes and then seeing the systems down there in, in, uh, in Dunedin, down the deep south, and the way they're playing, do you, do you think you think about the way you've actually attacked them when you were with the Hurricanes and think, oh, that's, that's obviously worked? I mean, is it, is it hard to adapt for yourself in, in a different environment? Yeah, bro, it is. Um, I guess I'm still trying to find my feet a little bit, um, only sort of being there for a week and having sort of a handful of training sessions and sort of just, I guess, figuring out the systems like you yeah, prior to, I guess, last year with the Canes and before. so sort of previewing teams and having a, I guess, a fair idea on how they play and, and what their style is. But um, I guess there have been a few tweaks to their game. I know they the boys sort of had a tough um, review over the first um, couple of months before COVID and they sort of looked pretty hard at their game. And, and I think they have come up with a few sort of adjustments as well. So, yeah, there's sort of a lot of um, a lot of adapting for me and, and getting used to the calls and, and the style of play. So, yeah, it's pretty full on. Let's let's talk about what you can offer, though. The fact all of that experience. I mean, are you looking for a leadership role in some way, shape, or form? What is it? What's your motivation going down there? What it is that you think that you can add to this group? Yeah, bro. I definitely think, um, I guess, looking at my age and sort of how many years I've been around, that can be a benefit. Like, yeah, it is a young crew down there. A lot of the boys are, you know, young and eager. First few years at this level so um yeah I'd hope that you know I could just share with them what I've picked up over the years um but then at the same time though they're some of them are absolute freaks so you know I'm acting like a sponge as well and absorbing all the I guess the energy and excitement and I guess learning off their skill sets um you know a lot of the boys have that sevens background so you know they're ready to pull trigger anytime they get the ball and um yeah that's it's kind of a two-way street really yeah I've, I've played and been around for a few years um but at the same time you know i'm open to, to learning off these young boys and they've got plenty to offer well, we've been saying brownie's been a freak for years <laughs> that, that just doesn't change i mean the the tony brown factor the fact that i'm sure you've heard so much about it he was part of that coaching team that that won a super rugby title in wellington what conversations have you had with, with him and how do you see your philosophies on the game do they sort of align i could imagine given the fact he's the attack coach and the way that you play, there's some things that you do like about each other's approach to, to rugby union? Yeah, 100%. I've got um, massive respect for Brownie and, and um, under no illusions as to what kind of coach, how great of a coach he is. Um, yeah, not only the stuff he's done with the Landers, but over in Japan. And yeah, I see him as a real sort of innovator. Um, he challenges a lot of not orthodox um, ways of play, but, you know, he's always creative in terms of thinking I guess, you know, what we can do differently. And, um, yeah, that, that does sort of suit the style and, and the way I like to play is sort of just play what I see and not be too um, structured in a way. But in saying that, though, Brownie does, you know, there's a reason and a purpose behind doing things. And, and I guess if you have the skill set, which he, he really hones in on and makes sure the boys are sharp with that, then your game can just flow and, and you can play whatever. Now, have you sort of earmarked a, a return to, to play that? I know you're rehabbing a little bit, but have you sort of worked out when, when you think we'll be back out there on the field? Oh, we haven't sort of 
put in a day as such, um, still getting through a bit of, or starting to get into a bit of contact and that. So, yeah, I guess the next week will sort of depend and give us a better idea of, of when I could be, you know, a date on getting back to playing. Um, still a couple of hoops to jump through around, yeah, the rehab and, and contact progressions. Um, but just, you know, seeing the way the boys are training, you know, you always, yeah, it's hard sort of standing on the sidelines or just watching them go at it. So, yeah, bro, I'm chomping at the bits uh, to get amongst it as soon as. Is this more for you, Nehi, about the here and the now? Or are there aspirations to chase maybe another game in an all-black jersey? Yeah, no, I've got massive drive. Um, you know, people ask me all the time and I think I'd be, you know, kidding myself if, or, you know, I probably wouldn't want to play the game if I don't want to be the best, um, you know, near me on the scudder rugby player as possible. And so, um, yeah, that's definitely a dream. It's def that's always the aspiration to be the best player I can be. And I guess the pinnacle is being being in the black jersey. So that's, um, yeah, that's on the radar. But, yeah, I'm under under no illusions that, you know, I've got plenty of hard work to, to go before then. And I guess at the minute, I'm just yeah, grateful that I've got an opportunity. Um, that I'm around some amazing people, got some amazing support behind me. So, um, yeah, bro, I'm just, I'm just loving it at the moment. Look, you're a unique talent. It is fantastic to have you back here in New Zealand. When you're at your best, you are one of the very best. Mate, look after yourself. Take care. But get back out there, mate. Rip into it and enjoy that time under the roof. You'll have a great time playing and being part of this Highlanders team down in today. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon, mate. Legend. Cheers, Les. Cheers, Goldie. Cheers, Nosey. Thanks for that. Well, as this is the last time we'll be doing this show from lockdown, of course, we're back in studio. We're back into Sky next Tuesday night. I want to do a big thanks to everyone that's contributed to this show. My team who are on uh, the panel this week who have been with me through the whole course of it, Tim and Jim and Ben and everyone behind the scenes, and, of course, all of the great people that have helped out and, and put it together to keep us informed. I'm going to miss you guys like this, but I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next week back at Sky. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? I think uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think there's been a little bit of an anxiety about how different people will approach uh, getting out of lockdown, but I think uh, I'm excited to get back out there. And I'm just incredibly proud of New Zealand. You know, I think it's, I was thinking about it tonight after talking to Jacinda and, you know, the whole country's really come together and done a great job, but now it's time to move on. And uh, we need to learn the lessons from COVID, I believe. You know, I, I looked... I always try and look at myself first. What am I going to learn from COVID that was better and move forward with that? And so that's that's an exciting time, you know. I'm going to appreciate the little things. It's actually getting out of my house and back into work, a change of scene. I'm even beginning to miss you clowns. So uh, bring on <laughs> next week. I'm going to just love hanging out, uh, talking a little bit of, you know, uh, spin some you know what and just reconnect on a human level so um yeah really excited to be back the truth here. comes out the truth comes out mills i mean but the people that we've had on this show and the people behind the scenes tim and ben and, and jim obviously putting it all together but the the way they've actually opened up their their screens and, and come on board and jumped on board i know jk you've spoken about new zealanders coming together but also the rugby community as well you know being able to you know it's you know, been on the other side as a player and open it up yourself and come on shows like this is, it can be a difficult thing but to share their stories and be able to come on board has been fantastic i'm looking forward to getting back in studio and i tell you what i'm, I'm damn looking forward to not getting back to this technicality side of things because my computer yes. and this we're microphone working. and everything else damn get me out of this room <laughs> <laughs> <Hands on. laughs> well said that's us from the breakdown tonight we'll see you seven days time but as always there'll be plenty more to talk about we'll see you then